thanks, Anna. Thanks. I've just noticed that we're almost hitting a 100 participants. Is that right? Seems to be, yeah. Okay. Anyway, I thanks don't. for the invitation. <laughs> it's a uh, great opportunity to uh, come back to the UK. In fact, I mean, only virtually, but I, I, uh, I had a great time over there and I'm still missing it, I must say. Uh, yeah, tonight about the European Trauma Code from startup to standard. When I got involved the first time around, uh, it was a uh, basically merely existing conflict of interest on my side is I'm the chairperson of the European Trauma Course organization. That's an unpaid position. It's a uh, charity that was set up. Tonight I'll be talking about the idea, about the background, about the European cooperation, which has made it so successful, about the educational concept, not too much about a the international implementation, which is a really exciting, and about new developments and challenges to trauma training in general, which you certainly all have experienced as well. This is where I currently live and work, that's Bielefeld, and uh, that is a uh, very close to the Dutch border in the uh, north, uh, uh, west of Germany. I think those that have served in the forces in Germany might know it, because this hospital I'm working at it used to be the a referral center for the uh, for the army and the air force, which were a base to Bielefeld. Unfortunately, they're gone. I hope they're coming back at some point. Uh, it looks uh, promising. Anyway, uh, this is when I look out. Uh, this is how it looks like uh, when I look out of my theater window. So I'm a, in, a, in a nice position over there. So I will be telling a bit a a bit a bit about myself because my history is a bit and it's not not that easy and that explains probably a bit of the European trauma course as well. So um, my I did my a uh, uh, training as a consultant anesthetist at my first pre-hospital year at Göttingen University Medical Center, which is a huge center in the middle of Germany. I uh, used to be lead of the HEM service as well over there. I, in uh, 2000, I was up for a new challenge and I went to the Netherlands and I uh, was involved in setting up the tra trauma network, which uh, I was basically uh, a consequence of the two disasters in Phone Dam in the Netherlands in 2000 and in Enschede in 2002. Enschede was a uh, it was an explosion of a fireworks factory killing 20 people and wiping out a borough completely. It uh, looks a bit like uh, after a bomb attack. And that they showed that the uh, Dutch trauma system wasn't really up to speed. And the government uh, has decided to set up a trauma network. And within two years, it was up and running. And in my view, it is probably now one of the most advanced trauma care system in Europe. Uh, in 2005, I moved uh, to uh, Birmingham and took up a position at Birmingham Children's Hospital as a consultant in pediatric anesthesia. It was my second hobby and uh, my second professional hobby, and I thought I would be giving up trauma at this point uh, because it wasn't really on the agenda at Birmingham Children's. That's changed after the release of uh, the 2007 and Seaport report, Trauma Who Cares? You all know it, uh, which a uh, revealed that 60% of the UK trauma patients were getting substandard care, uh, leading to uh, pretty high mortality. And uh, I mean, it took another three, four years because uh, uh, changes kicked in and the trauma networks, the UK trauma networks were set up. And I that went a uh, Birmingham Children's Hospital as all the other major trauma centers uh, with major, along with major changes and the major challenges, because all of a sudden we had to cope with numbers of trauma patients we'd never seen before, especially at Birmingham Children's, who were not uh, used to teach or to treat uh, major trauma that came from the street. Um, it was not only a, cha a challenge for uh, the hospitals, it was of course a challenge for the ambulance services as well, that all of a sudden had to uh, get trauma patients in over miles and miles and miles of distances directly from the street to the MTCs. Um, and it was obvious that at some point uh, we uh, needed to, to up our game in the emergency departments, not only in the emergency, but everybody had to up their games, but uh, there was a significant training deficit in those days and we had to streamline our pathways. At this point, I, uh, this gentleman is probably well known to all of you, I, uh, approached me and asked me if we could a, uh, start a trauma team training program. And I, now you certainly ask yourself, why was he asking me? 
And I, this is a bit of an incision here, and I, I go back to the start of the European Trauma Course program. Um, trauma, in fact, is, as we all know, as regarded as a surgical disease. But in many parts of Europe, uh, the focus was not on disease, but on surgical. And that has led to a, let us say in the past, a bit of a tweaked approach to trauma. So we saw things uh, where a trauma care wasn't really focusing on the vital function care, but, but mainly on orthopedic aspects. So we saw, for instance, immobilization styles like the baby that you see here on the spine board, or we had the standing uh, takedowns that fortunately have uh, disappeared now from clinical practice. But I, uh, this is a state in Ireland ferry crash 2013. So we see uh, uh, more than 50 patients, more or less uninsured, taped down on spine boards with the uh, collars around the neck and just setting the wrong focus. And in fact, we have lost patients because they, we didn't put the focus on vital function care, but more on spine and orthopedic injuries. For me, the kickoff uh, starting this program was uh, it was a car accident. It was a car accident that took place almost twenty years ago in the Netherlands, and there was a gentleman who was a uh, uh, driving his car into an unilluminated container. He was standing in the middle of the road in an industrial area. So he was getting out of his car. He was calling the police. Uh, police came and the officers uh, invited him to sit in the rear of the police car to do the paperwork. And then the ambulance service arrived and he, they, they, they found whilst he was sitting in the back of the car that he had a bit of neck pain and it wasn't quite okay. And then they told him that they would extricate him from this car. So they told him we need to cut off the roof of this car. And uh, yeah, did they do it? Yes, they did. You see the photograph, and this is a Dutch police car that's being cut to pieces. And uh, you see the spine board uh, uh, behind the back of this patient who's been extricated. Why did they do that? Of course, they followed a strict ATLS guidelines. Say there was a severe deformation of the car, high energy impact, potentially severely injured patient, spine mobilization vital functions were stable, extrication. Um, so the patient was discharged from hospital 30 minutes after admission to hospital. He was basically uninjured. And uh, the only victim uh, of this accident was a Dutch police force, the Utrecht police force that suffered a total loss of a brand new police car. Um, I made a case report out of this and they wrote a uh, a. Uh, a statement regarding introduction of a ATLS in the Netherlands and in Germany, which I found not quite appropriate for care, for a for team care for major trauma patient. And uh, at this point, uh, Peter Basket came back to me. Peter Basket was a the chairman of the European Resuscitation Council and the editor of uh, Resuscitation in those days. And he asked me uh, what I would suggest to do when I. Yeah, I was quite surprised to get such an invitation, and uh, I made a proposal uh, to set up a European trauma teaching program, and uh, he asked me to do this on behalf of the uh, ERC. But I wasn't the only one who was thinking that we need a new approach to trauma teaching. So that is a, a photograph of participants of a meeting in Bologna, in Italy. And I, this group, they uh, stuck their heads together in 2002. And I were thinking about how we can achieve this European trauma training program. And I, uh, the photos are very sharp. You might recognize a few of them. This is here for this Peter Oakley. This is Charles Deacon. Uh, this is Peter Driscoll. Uh, this is Carl Gwinnett, probably, uh, known to the uh, majority of you. They have a, uh, obviously had a major impact on the trauma training and trauma care in the UK. And this meeting was in fact a uh, uh, on invitation of Giuseppe Nardi. Giuseppe was the 
head of the Italian Resuscitation Council, and uh, he was, which I was never supposed to tell, in fact, but it's now so long ago, he was, in fact, the anesthetist and intensivist of the Pope. Um, so I, uh, on, on behalf of the ESA, with the help of Peter Baskin and David Seidemann, I've approached all these people again, and they, uh, we set the frame for a training program together, and it was obvious that what we need uh, uh, needs to be evidence-based. It needs to be where there is no evidence based on common sense. Multi-specialty needs to reflect a team approach because that's how we work in Europe. It needs to be adaptable to the different European settings because trauma care in Spain is not uh, the same as a uh, trauma care in Scandinavia or a trauma care in Romania. Uh, it also needs to embrace adult education because uh, the uh, the target groups we are aiming at are experienced clinicians, and uh, we need to make it a kind of shared learning experience to get them on board, because you can't ram just a facts, dogma, and, um, and, 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 and guidelines in the heads of people. They have to adopt them, so you have to... You have to work with them, and you have to appreciate that they're all experienced clinicians. Uh, affordable was important as well, and of course you need international accreditation. If you don't have international accreditation, you it is pretty pointless to start it because we we see very good trauma courses, but they're very focal, but they uh, never get a wider recognition. So we worked a on two working streams at the same time. One working stream was just to get the cause ready to get the contents ready. The other was to get uh, international accreditation. So we started negotiating with the European Society of Trauma and Emergency Surgery, with the ESA, the European Society of Anesthesiology, the European Society of Emergency Medicine, and all under the umbrella of the European Research Council. It was quite tricky because they, uh, they, uh, all the organizations were not used to work together and to uh, start joint projects. It took us, uh, indeed, three years to get them all uh, uh, onto the same line. And it was in 2006 and we got this invitation. We were not ready by then from Malta, from Malta to start a, a, a trauma course uh, because they couldn't afford ATLS. And they heard through the grapevine that the ESC was working on uh, uh, this trauma course. And I, yeah, Malta quite down there. We were not ready, we had a, uh, but we had only three months to go. And then we said, look, this is maybe an opportunity. Uh, let's sit down and get it finished. And um, uh, of course, I mean, we knew Malta is far away. Uh, that goes pear shaped down in Malta. We pack our bags and pretend it never happened. Uh, and, uh, but it wasn't like that. It, it went quite well. And this is the faculty of this Malta course. And you see Pete Driscoll and Carl Burnett and a, a lot of other guys uh, from Italy, from Portugal, from Germany, from, what have we got? Belgium as well. So, so a very mixed faculty started this and it was in fact a, uh, a huge success. And I, two years late in 2008, uh, after further three uh, pilot courses, we had refined the teaching methodology, the team teaching methodology that we were able to launch the course in Brussels at the 2008 meeting of the European Research Council. So let's have a look at the course. I, uh, I'll show a few pics from different courses to give you an impression how the whole program works. Uh, the objectives were or are still initial clinical management of major trauma as a team, and of course, teaching and addressing non-technical skills. Uh, why are non-technical skills in trauma and team work, team trauma work so important? Uh, because we are performing complex teamwork under pressure, and this is prone to go wrong, prone to medical error. And I, we know that 70% of all medical errors are due to human factor breakdown. Um, why do human factors break down then? The question is, it maybe it is lack of trust amongst the team, it is lack of respect. That leads to loss of cohesion within the team and the human factor breakdown. So it is not only about the clinical skills. I, very often we have observed excellent clinicians that were not able to work together. And I, 
this is where a, a error kicks in. And uh, I think a major trauma patient is probably better off being treated by a team that's maybe less experienced, but a, has a good understanding of non-technical skills and is able to work together. If it's not the case, we are facing uh, the Swiss cheese model, which you all know, and I'm not going to go into this. Uh, those are the objectives that you all know as well, because non-technical skills these days is not new to you. Uh, so how do we put this into practice? How does the course look like these days? The target groups we're aiming at are doctors that are involved in trauma care. They should have a basic knowledge of trauma. We are a, a aiming at 80 nurses, paramedics that are at an independent practitioner level. We've recently added a trauma support practitioner. So those are a nurses, paramedics in their primary assisting role. So I think in the UK, we would say band five, band six practitioners. The course format, it is a two and a half days course. We uh, take 24, or if we've got uh, trauma support practitioners, 36 candidates, we've got at least 12 instructors. Uh, there's only one lecture, there's only one effective demonstration, and we take our candidates through 11 workshops. There is continuous assessment at the end of the course. A, there is a test scenario which the candidates have to pass. The bottom line is that the candidates spend about 90% of the time in practical workshops. Teaching material they need is uh, quite straightforward. ALS dummies, airway equipment, uh, including uh, surgical airway stuff, IV drips, equipment for chest strains, uh, immobilization equipments. We have got two laptops per workstation for x-ray interpretation and uh, Vital function information is fed through a monitoring system. We use very often Simon, but whatever you use, it doesn't really matter. What you need is an ECG, you do blood pressure entirely, so you do the basic monitoring. Uh, the candidates are a uh, working in group in groups of four or a six if you've got trauma support practitioner, and they work together as trauma teams in a trauma bay-like environment. Uh, the roles that we've got are the team leader role, the team member roles, and we always have got observers uh, that help us with the feedback uh, and the debrief. And we've got the trauma support practitioners, which are the circulating nurse and the scribe. And we don't uh, have set groups. That means that after each workshops, the groups are mixed up again. And I that was, um, in fact, quite interesting. It's a great experience for us to see. Uh, if you don't work with fixed groups in the life support courses, you find out that the uh, continuous assessment is really difficult because the individual performance depends very much on the group constellation and can change from group to group. Um, so here you see the clinicians in their uh, uh, typical classical position. You've got an A clinician at the airway, you've got a B clinician examining the chest, you've got a C clinician who's trying to get a line in and uh, at the foot end, there is the team leader who's supposed to stay hand off, hands off. Um, introduction of trauma support practitioners, which uh, we've done in the UK now for a few years, but it is a uh, pretty new in uh, in other European countries. The typical role that we've got is a um, the more or less the circulating nurse, which is here assisting uh, the airway clinician and uh, the documenting nurse, a uh, which a has got a uh, trauma admission seat making the documentation. We found out that it is in fact a, a great position to order the process as well, because if you've got a good documentation sheet, they, uh, they easily see if you overlook things and they are very able to support the trauma team leader to make sure that nothing's overlooked in the process. I, same setup here in the Netherlands at the Amsterdam Medical Center and the Simulation Center. And I, we found out 
if you run it like this, um, you basically have got a setup which you can take as it is into your a daily clinical training. So this is, for instance, a uh, the a trauma training session at Greifswald University Medical Center. Uh, where we basically run ETC scenarios uh, with the full trauma team. And uh, once you've got the role allocation, once you've got the uh, role definitions of the TSP, uh, you see how easy it is to implement in daily clinical practice. So as you already see from the pics, the uh, characteristics of this course is very hand-on. It's more or less purely scenario-based. We work in small groups and it is extremely intense. So uh, candidates and instructors are knackered after the course. We've got a, uh, 10 workshops where we address a, uh, specific themes as airway management as uh, difficult airway management as well uh, standard settings as a uh, rapid sequence inductions are toward a shock management uh, where we have got uh, skills training as well as vascular access a uh, chest trauma you see here insertion of a uh, chest strain as a skill which is here embedded into a scenario in the context taught in the context of a scenario setting uh, traumatic brain injury with a um, short tutorials on uh, reading head CTs, uh, pediatric trauma, um, and uh, we do have some uh, scenarios where we, this is at the end of the course, we were able to put 15 people together uh, and run massive scenarios where we illustrate the complexities of uh, communication uh, if you've got uh, different layers of hierarchies, if you've got a, uh, different groups working on separate items together. And that is one of the uh, highest ranking scenarios indeed of the whole cause. And then we've got a, uh, some surprise scenarios as well. And I, I want you to look at this one here uh, where this patient is basically at the end of a workshop a, uh, thrown into the scenario or not into this into the workshop. The, the candidate is expecting to uh, leave the room to have a coffee break, and we throw this patient in and then see what some terms, what shall they all ah, themselves. Ah, ah, I'll ah, take ah, from the room ah, of ah, leader, if you can get ah, 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 so well, this is kindly supplied from a uh, St. George's in London. And I, um, what you see is a, that uh, the candidates are able to organize themselves without any input from the instructor. You throw this patient in and you see that the system works. Now let's have a look at the scenarios themselves, how we uh, set up the scenarios. Uh, each workshop contains of two to four, about 15 minutes scenarios, and uh, they are followed by a 10 to 15 minutes debrief each. All the scenarios have very specific learning objectives, and the scenario contains uh, of a briefing where we uh, outline the learning objective first, and then we take the candidates who discarded a trauma admission scenario, most of the scenarios entail an integrated still teaching session and, uh, of course, a team debriefing at the end of the scenarios. The scenarios start usually with a, uh, a pre-alert for the emergency department, the team gathers, and they, there's a quick team introduction, team brief, uh, skill set of the candidates is checked to make sure that you've got the right person in the right position, the case is presented, a plan A is made, a plan B is discussed, equipment check follows, um, a, then the patient rolls in. And this is kindly provided for the military hospital in Ulm. Okay, uh, then basically the uh, scenario runs and uh, after conclusion of the scenario, we start with a debrief. Scenario usually ends when a, the patient is either stable or the patient 
this is can happen too. A patient can't be stabilized and needs to go to theaters or somewhere else. The debriefing is a most crucial part of the learning experience. And uh, mm, this is where we appraise individual uh, performance aspects, where we appraise team aspects, and we reflect on the learning objectives. There's a extremely important that we maintain a positive and a friendly attitude during the debriefs and you, during running the scenarios as well, because they, the, uh, one of the most important aspects of learning is psychological safety. If you break down psychological safety, people can't really engage. They can't engage with the scenarios, they can't engage with the debrief, and they can't make mistakes. And I, uh, and this, so we are a, uh, focusing on creating a good and productive atmosphere for the candidates. So how do the candidates like the cause? Um, we have an audit system. So uh, uh, after each cause, we a, uh, uh, or candidates fill in uh, these these audit forms, and four is a uh, excellent rating, uh, three is good, two is a uh, okay fair, and one is uh, unsatisfactory. And you see that the candidate score is relatively high. These are means. That means they can't go higher than four. That if you would look at median, so the, the, the vast majority of the score is four. So excellent. And we do this for all the workshops and for further aspects of the course to see uh, uh, if we compare them, we compare different centers, how the performance of the centers is, and they, uh, we use them to uh, address specific topics. I, I've put this together. This is a qualitative feedback and to, in a word cloud, and uh, it shows what a uh, candidates really appreciate. And they, they love the scenario training. They love the team training. Uh, the positive attitude of the faculty, and We basically, they. Uh, this is what we get from from the vast majority of all our courses. So, uh, wherever we do this, it is more or less alike. So, uh, let's have a look at the spread of the program. It was in two thousand thirteen. In two thousand thirteen, I uh, we were in the UK in Central Europe and in Finland. Two thousand fourteen, so a significant spread of the course. Um, a, uh, this is where we are in 2022. Uh, but in fact, the course has a, uh, a uh, spread beyond Europe. We have active programs in Egypt, in the Emirates, in Jordan, Tunisia, in Sudan, and even in Brazil. So uh, the demand for running uh, ETC courses is uh, really high, and we have really difficulties to. I satisfy all the applications that we have. You see uh, growth of the program. Uh, so we'll just, just move my thingy here yeah, so you can't see it. Look, I, in 2006, we started with one course, and in uh, 2018, we had a uh, 120 courses. Then Corona kicked in, and there was a significant blow to the program, as you can imagine, because uh, all teaching sees more or less so. In fact, we were quite pleased that in 2020, we still were able to manage a uh, 40 courses. The program is picking up slowly now. We're almost uh, back to pre-corona levels. Slide doesn't move, don't know why. Oh, here we go. Uh, so it gives you an idea a, uh, uh, where we teach, where we teach the most candidates. And the most we teach indeed in the in the UK between 2017 and 22, we've taught a uh, two and a half thousand in the UK. Germany is number two with a uh, 1500 candidates. And then we've got Egypt, 
Austria, Belgium, and so on. We don't really know, uh, we don't audit the specialties uh, uh, of doctors and clinicians that come to our courses, but uh, the uh, ETC Austria has done it once and uh, it gives a fair distribution between anesthesia and surgery. And uh, we must say that in Austria, there's emergency medicine is a, uh, not represented as a standalone specialty. Uh, so the emergency physicians uh, that have attended these courses there are probably from abroad. Yeah, and I'm obviously uh, challenged with the integration of the trauma support practitioners, and we have audited this as well, and uh, had a uh, look at pre and post course results. I just taken this. I'm not really sure if you've seen it as well, which is always not. Can I move this? And screen share? Sorry. Okay. Good. I. Um, and of course, we have asked them a couple of questions, a couple of quite a few questions on on how they like the course, what they need, you know, what they think we need to change, and uh, I'll just say uh, present you with a few slides that show the outcomes uh, regarding their perception what they have learned. And I uh, we had always a, a good mix of uh, trauma support practitioners. I quite a few came from trauma centers and. Um, it is interesting to see uh, the perception um, of their own understanding of the trauma team before and after the course. You see that before the course, it wasn't quite that good, even though they came from trauma centers. After the course, significantly better. Same is true in terms of confidence. We see uh, significant confidence growth amongst the uh, trauma support practitioners that have attended the course. So that is basically, uh, that was a, a, a huge success for the program, I must say. We have now adopted this as a standard feature, the trauma support practitioners and uh, uh, course centers can choose optional whether they want to run courses with or without trauma support practitioners. This program is now running in Germany, in the UK, in the Netherlands, and uh, the other countries are in the process of picking this up. Um, the uh, COVID was a, uh, a made us rethinking how we uh, how we going to deliver our teaching. Because obviously face-to-face -face teaching, there are times where we probably uh, will have a significant problems in conducting face-to-face -face teaching. And uh, uh, we all know that a, uh, uh, we have this one pandemic, but certainly not, not the last one. So we have to uh, really see how we can uh, uh, conduct teaching uh, and reducing the face-to-face -face time to a minimum. So we have decided then in uh, 2020 to create an entirely online recertification course. Um, and it went surprisingly well, I must say. Uh, we all had only limited uh, experience with the uh, virtual learning environments. Uh, so we dug into it and uh, created a recertification course for uh, our uh, candidates uh, that was basically as an eight hours recertification course it is a multimodal, it is interactive and uh, it uses a lot of external resources and links. And uh, in fact, it was a great success. We were quite surprised by the success we had. Uh, now we've got now uh, 500 candidates recertified uh, and we had feedback from uh, 350 candidates and they all, I uh, found it more or less excellent. There was only one candidate, only one candidate of the uh, 500 candidates who said he was a, not satisfied with the quality of the course. So that is obviously a, uh, a feature of teaching that we all have to embrace. And uh, we have to see how we use the face-to-face -to, -face to have more efficient and uh, a, uh, work with virtual learning environments to a, to transport knowledge and use the time during the course basically only to apply this existing knowledge. And I, it is nothing different than uh, 
a uh, and an inverted classroom teaching, I must say. Um, but there are certainly a, a times where we can't conduct any face-to-face -face teaching at all. And we all a, experience significant pressures at the moment, releasing staff from uh, uh, their clinical duties, uh, getting doctors, getting candidates, and the ETC course runs two and a half days is a pretty long course. For the instructors, it is even uh, uh, three and a half days because uh, every course is preceded by a uh, instructor training day, which we use to uh, train instructor candidates because the teaching method is very different from other life support courses. And I, which we use as well to prepare ourselves for the cause because, I, as I said, the cause is intense. The scenarios don't run as straight as ALS scenarios because a trauma is different and a, uh, uh, injuries can present in many, many ways. That means you really have to be well prepared to run your scenario as well. Um, so I think we need to embark on... Uh, more virtual learning as well for the instructors and uh, for the regular course as well to make sure that we uh, use the face-to-face -face time as efficient as we can. Another project that we are a, uh, currently exploring is a, the use of virtual reality. Uh, I'll show a quick video. So that means, in fact, a, uh, that we can train from home. We need VR goggles for this, obviously, and, and uh, this uh, there wasn't a scenario that was just a uh, a pilot uh, start scenario to explore how things work and. Uh, a, we're working with a VR company together and see whether we can they take parts of the team training into virtual reality. The first steps are, I must say, they're quite encouraging. Uh, and they, what we see is indeed suspense of disbelief. I had the opportunity to uh, a, watch others being in virtual reality. And at some point, I, you see one person in Bielefeld, one person in Southampton, one person in Oslo, and they are bending all over uh, x-rays, discussing the x-rays, and then you know they're in the scenario. And in fact, it takes a virtual reality a, in a well-made scenario, about three to four minutes, and you're in it. We haven't really established a uh, where the position of virtual reality in, uh, in trauma training is, but I'm sure it has got a place. So uh, one of the big challenges for the future is to find this place and at the same time to drive virtual reality forward to make it even better. I mean, it's obvious that the virtual reality has not any haptics, so you don't feel a thing, but a um, virtual reality, a uh, the avatars you're working with, they, I mean, they don't have facial expression yet, but they are able to talk. And it's very funny. You talk and you see a, uh, uh, the mouth moving, mouth opening, and it looks quite good. And you are very much able to dive into this. So uh, this is probably what we're going to see in the future. As I said, I don't really know where it stands, but we're experimenting with it. And uh, I'm very confident that we probably a, uh, in two or three years will be able to integrate this into our recertification program. Yeah, that was a quick run through through the European trauma course, a, uh, giving you an idea where we a, currently stand, where we're heading to. Um, a, uh, yeah, I'm open to questions. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Carl, for that thorough, thorough oversight of everything that you do. I didn't, I, I mean, I personally didn't realise quite how widespread that you guys were. Um, and also I learned tonight as well that you were involved with trauma care in the early days, which is fascinating for me. So thank you for that. 
So I'm just going to bring up our screen again, guys. As you all know, this is the last uh, webinar of 2022. However, our next webinar it will be on January the 4th. So bang straight into the new year. We are kicking off with a brand new webinar, which is what are we trying to achieve? Outcomes in trauma presented by Tim Coates. Now, this webinar is going to sort of be looking at TARN, at the auditing network and look at the after effects of the patient. Should we be talking to patients more in their trauma and learning from their experiences rather than just sort of learning from our own experiences in traumatology from the clinical side of things? So actually, we're going to look at the patient perspective a little bit. So scan the QR code that's on your screen now if you want to register for that. And of course, if you're not a member, as I mentioned at the beginning, this is your chance to get your QR code, uh, to get your QR code, to get your CPD certificate, scan the QR code, and it will take you through to the payment screen. You can fill out the feedback form. And from there, you'll be able to purchase your CPD certificate and it will be sent straight to your inbox. If there are any issues with certificates being issued, whether you're a member or a non-member, please email us, um, admin at traumacare.org.uk, and we will sort it out for you as soon as we can. So... I'm just going to bring up the questions. We have had two questions come in. So guys, please um, pop your questions in uh, as and when you feel like it, as we're answering these, anything like that, please pop your questions into the Q&A section. I can't see them in the chat at the moment because I've only got the Q&A box open. So please put them into the Q&A section and I will ask Carl. So the first one is from M. Bracken Carl. Are your courses run with a focus on the hospital setting or do they include pre-hospital scenarios as well? Uh, the, the the initial initiative was indeed was on the, was on a pre-hospital course, and then we realised that it was very difficult to achieve in the uh, in the very old days because we had doctor staffed systems, we had paramedical systems, and so there was a huge diversity in Europe. So we started with the uh, uh, with the uh, the trauma bay with the in-hospital environment, and we never get, got 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 any further because the demand on this course is so high. That we didn't have the capacity to uh, develop a pre-hospital course. It was always, uh, it's still on our agenda, but we haven't got around to do this. Fair enough, fair enough. Okay, and uh, Brian has asked as well, how important do you think it is that we can interact via European languages? Sorry, what was that? Interact by European languages? Interact via, so with European languages. How important oh, my, do you if think you, it if is? <laughs> The majority, of course, is still run in English all over Europe, and uh, so the Dutch courses are in English. And they, uh, I mean, what we do is we exchange instructors as well. We encourage all instructors that they uh, go to other countries to teach on other courses, and the uh, instructors from abroad are always welcome on other courses. So we are, as English speakers, in a uh, very favourable position. So not native English speakers, they've got much more difficult to travel around. But a, uh, English is always a feature of the courses, and there are hardly any courses where you can't speak English. Wonderful, thank you. So, so yeah, um, I'm not going to comment on that myself really because I'm not uh, too clued up on it. Someone, uh, someone in the chat has asked, um, "Can I take this course anywhere, and will the standard be considered the same?" So, basically, I think they're asking if they take if they do a course and and take their knowledge elsewhere, is the standard considered the same all around the world, not just Europe? Yes. And that's just at least what we strive at. <laughs> we, have, we, we have noticed that there are a, uh, significant differences in, uh, in, in courses that are being delivered at the moment. We have now uh, revamped our entire course material to make sure that we're all back on coming to the same standard. And I, As you know, with a, such a fast-growing program, it is very difficult to, uh, uh, to, to uh, implement robust governments. Well, we try our best to do that, and we will be getting better at it. But... The certificate is basically a recognize wherever you obtain it. Perfect. Thank you. So I would encourage everybody highly as you as I can see people tonight joining us from all over. So we've had people. Oh. And another question from Reese has come in. Um, do you find participants paying for the course themselves or do they get funding from their health board or employer X? I think that's a, a question, basically. Should I fund it myself or should I try and... Uh, should I try and reach to my employer and my health board to, to fund this for me? It depends on the, uh, I mean, uh, uh, obviously Chinese have put a budget, they can use it for the course. Of course, as they uh, recognize a uh, equivalent to ATLS in the UK, it is recognized by the Royal College of Surgeons of England and the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh. And they, uh, you can use it for your training, so you probably should get some form of reimbursement from a 
uh, from, uh, I don't know exactly how this works in the UK, either from your employer, if you've got a budget or from uh, a, from your training institution, but a, uh, mm, I mean, it's not, it's not guaranteed, but a, go give it a go. Perfect, perfect. So just going to, another question has just popped in. Um, we'll answer that one. Uh, Rian will uh, send you an email for that one just because we're, we're slightly unsure on the answer, but we will research that one for you and send you an answer for that. Um, so with that uh, being said, I would, um, I'd highly recommend that people sort of download the manuals, look at the online material that ETC have to offer, look at the courses that could be local to you because they are, um, they are very, very valuable as you can see doing the live live case scenarios as we saw and the, the whole course set up is brilliant, quite akin to sort of the things that we do, but I think on a more practical level. So I would recommend definitely looking into the courses, um, looking into the courses available near you and getting yourself on there. And I will say for, from the English board, obviously you guys, you do get your CPD um, budgets and whatnot in hospitals and you get all sorts of things for courses where you can take uh, working leave. So if you do have the opportunity to get some funding for it, I would absolutely recommend trying that first rather than funding it yourselves. Same with ours as well, um, because the our CPD certificates are also recognised sort of by the Royal College of Paramedics, by the board, um, by the medical government. Um, if you do want to come to one of our regional conferences, which next year are taking place in Birmingham, Manchester and Bristol, I would absolutely recommend trying to get some um, funding from your governing body first uh, and then before paying for it for yourself. That is to say, all that's left to say is thank you to our sponsors. As always, uh, without the sponsors, obviously, trauma care wouldn't be here so thank you so much as always to galen who manufactured penthrox the first line emergency analgesic it's about time scan the qr code that's on your screen right now you can see galen's cpd uh, webinars that are available and this is their sort of their administration um i always forget what it's actually called the guidelines that's the word i'm looking for on how to use penthrox if you use it and you're unsure please do email me um anna.hickling at traumacare.org.uk and i will send you this screen across so you can see uh, the ins and outs of penthrox and thanks to Icarus, as always, Power Health. Icarus are a wonderful company who do lots of live simulations. They uh, work all around the country, in and out of universities as well. Scan the QR code that's on your screen there. You'll see all the trauma-based scenarios that they do and live, live simulation-based training. Really, really cool company. World Extreme Medicine, our newest sponsor, they basically are like us, but they work in extreme circumstances. So they work all across the world. They've just done some wonderful work in the Ukraine as well. They have courses available online where um, CPD certificate based as well. They also have lots and lots of practical courses available where you will be put into adverse competitions. You'll be sent up to the mountains to learn how to work in those scenarios. And we have recently launched, and we're very, very proud to say that we have recently launched our academic partnership programme. And our first partner is the University of Wolverhampton. So we are now proudly partnered with the University of Wolverhampton. We've given all of their students free access to trauma care, we're working very closely with them to bring them bits and bobs. If you scan the QR code that's on your screen now, it will take you through to the ACAS form, where if you have a child or you yourself are looking to apply to a new university to study paramedic science, this QR code will take you straight through to ACAS to apply for them. Or you can check online at the website at the bottom of your screen, and that will tell you all about the courses they have available. Um, they're a really cool university, um, quite a small cohort group that's there, but really wonderful. And we are very, very proud to have launched our academic partnership program and to be working with the University of Wolverhampton. That is to say, it's all to say from me, uh, that, that is all for me, not an all to say for me, because we are finished. So thank you very much for me and on behalf of Trauma Care, thank you very much, Carl, Carl, for coming in and talking to us all about ETC and everything that's involved in it. It's a fascinating programme. I certainly want to find out more, despite not being medically inclined in the slightest, but it looks like a lot of fun as well as very, very educational. So thank you very much. Thank you, everybody, for joining us this evening. Um, thank you, everybody, very much for joining this evening. Hopefully we, you all have a wonderful Christmas if you celebrate it, if not, happy holidays. Wherever you are in the world, stay safe. I saw someone was here from Qatar tonight. I hope you're enjoying the, uh, the festivities that are going on over there at the moment. So thank you very much for me. Good evening. Good night, everybody. Stay safe.
Good night, Carl. Good night. Good night. Merry Christmas, everybody. Bye. <laughs> bye bye.